Good evening and welcome to Doc Talks. I'm Lisa Gooden with St. Charles Health System and we welcome you to this evening's presentation, Why Me? Cancer Risk Factors, Prevention and the Bad Luck Theory. Uh, before we start, I just want to tell you a little bit of, about Doc Talks in case this is your first time joining us. This is a series we actually launched uh, last fall so that we could get some of our wonderful physicians out in the community talking about some of the interesting research uh, and work that they're doing at our hospitals and clinics. And then, of course, COVID, and now we're virtual and broadcasting to you this evening into your home. So thank you for being with us and uh, we hope you will enjoy this evening and will join us for future talks. So presenting this evening is Dr. Christina Fitzmaurice who received her bachelor's degree from the Albert Ludwigs University Freiburg in Germany where she also attended medical school. She completed her internal med medicine residency training at the University of Wisconsin and completed a fellowship in hematology and oncology at the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. She was an assistant professor at the University of Washington prior to relocating to Central Oregon. Her areas of interest are breast and gastrointestinal cancers. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Fitzmaurice. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you so much for inviting me um, and the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I would rather be at McMinimins, but we all want to be safe, and so I'm here in our Redmond Cancer Clinic. Um, the title of my talk, as Lisa was saying, is Why Me? Cancer Risk Factors Prevention and the Bad Luck Theory. And I do have to say I had, um, I had a hard time choosing the topic for this talk, and the, the reason is that Oncology in 2020 is a very exciting field to be in. Um, almost every day we have news um, about new drugs being approved and new insights into why does cancer happen and what can we do to treat our patients better. So uh, um, let me see if I can advance my slides. I don't have any conflicts of interest, but I do have a very um, I do have a very strong interest in preventative oncology, and I worked before joining St. Charles last year at the University of Washington, and I led a team of researchers where we tried to determine the cancer burden in different countries around the world. And what is really striking is how different the cancer landscape looks depending on where you are born and what you are, what you are exposed to throughout your life. Clinically, I do actually face that almost every day here in Bend and in Redmond in the cancer clinic where patients, they come with the question is, why did this happen to me? Why did I get cancer? Or patients come and they blame themselves for, for example, having smoked um, for part of their life. And I do want to give a, um, a brief introduction into cancer risk factors with a, with a short video. Stories like these emphasize how important it is to understand what causes cancer. Research over the past 30 years has led to the discovery of exactly what causes cancers. Mutations cause cancers, but what causes these mutations? Three factors are responsible. First, random errors occur every time a cell divides and copies its DNA to make two new cells. This routine process happens millions of times every day in everyone's body and usually does no harm. However, cancers can occur when such errors, simply through bad luck, affect an important gene rather than an unimportant gene. Our research suggests that nearly two-thirds of the mutations that cause cancer are due to these errors, this sort of bad luck. The second factor is environmental. Some people add to the number of mutations in their bodies by their behavior, such as sunbathing or smoking. The third factor is inherited. Some people are born with mutations that make them more likely to get cancer. Let's use the analogy of typing using a keyboard. Because we are humans, the task of typing will of course result in typos. This is just like mutations that occur when normal cells divide. 
Behavior, such as typing while tired or when distracted, can cause even more typos, just as certain behaviors can cause extra mutations in DNA. A factory defect in the keyboard, like a stuck key or a missing key, can cause even more typos, just like an inherited factor can cause more mutations in DNA. Let's look at pancreatic cancers as an important example of these principles. About three quarters of the mutations that cause pancreatic cancers are due to errors made during the division of normal pancreas cells, that is, bad luck. About 20% of these mutations are due to environmental factors such as smoking, and the remaining 5% of the mutations that cause pancreatic cancer are inherited. Our research suggests that nearly two-thirds of the mutations that cause cancer are due to these errors, this sort of bad luck. Everyone should avoid behaviors that increase the chance that they'll get the mutations that cause cancers. But many people will develop cancer no matter how perfect their behaviors are. These people should certainly not feel guilty about getting the disease. There is nothing they could have done to avoid it. Because some cancers are inevitable, we believe that more research to find ways to detect cancers earlier while they're still curable is urgently needed. So uh, Christian Tomasetti and Bert Vogelstein, they published this bad luck theory in 2015. And um, you might maybe re remember that uh, hearing about this, it had got a lot of press coverage and it was very controversial, not just in um, the main press, but also in the scientific community. A lot of the confusion actually came from that people interpreted their studies as saying two thirds of cancers are to, uh, due to bad luck and obviously if you think about this, if two thirds of cancers are due to bad luck, why actually care about cancer prevention? Why not smoke and drink and do all the fun things that you want to do, but you're not supposed to do? So uh, this misinterpretation came from the fact that the researchers found that two thirds of cancer mutations were due to bad luck. And I will go a little bit more into detail to explain the difference. To uh, know what the difference is, you have to understand that for a, a normal cell to become cancerous, it actually takes on average three mutations. And the, the um, researchers found that the two thirds of the total mutations are due to bad luck. The, as, the, as you have seen in this video, these three types of mutations can come from either lifestyle or environment like smoking, inherited cancer genes or random bad luck. I actually really like that example about the typing. So uh, if you're human, no matter how good of a typer you are, you are gonna make a mistake. Like your body cells are gonna make mistakes when they divide um, just because of the fact we're human. If you uh, have a pizza, drink a couple of beers, you're maybe more likely to uh, make a mistake when you're typing. And then if you actually were delivered a, a, a faulty keyboard, well, no matter what, if you use, for example, your HP and it's stuck, there's no matter, like there's nothing you can do to avoid making mistakes. If we look at three cancers, I will start with pancreatic cancer, um, the example that I also used in the video. These 20 figures here each represents one person with pancreatic cancer. And the gray dots in the middle and the yellow dots and the, the blue dots, they represent the three mutations that are required to uh, develop cancer. So if you look at that first person, um, that person was unlucky enough and had one mutation because of purely bad luck. The gray mutation, the second mutation happens, for example, because that person smoked. And then he was also unlucky enough to inherit a bad gene from a parent and so it developed three mutations that then resulted in a normal cell developing into a pancreatic cancer cell. And so if you look at these 20 figures here, actually eight of these people, they have at least one mutation that comes from an environmental risk factor. And so it's potentially extra preventable. The 12 people, or let's look at the 10 people here at the bottom with the three 
yellow dots in the middle. Those people develop the three mutations purely out of bad luck. There's really no, um, there's no way of preventing their pancreatic cancer from ever happening. So um, what you see in this example here is despite two thirds of the mutations being due to bad luck, you still can actually prevent 40% of pancreatic cancer in this example. Going into uh, um, two more examples, look looking at two more examples. So lung cancer is kind of the prototype of a cancer that is caused by environmental risk factors, mainly smoking. You don't have a whole lot or any hereditary factors that we know about. But even in lung cancer, eight, um, sorry, 18 out of these 20 people developed lung cancer that could have been avoided. So even taking away one single mutation that happened, like this, this one mutation that happened, for example, because of environmental risk factors, you could have prevented the lung cancer from happening. There's still, even in lung cancer, these two people at the bottom that have the three yellow dots, they develop lung cancer purely out of bad luck, not because of any risk factors uh, that they were exposed to. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, we have prostate cancer. So in prostate cancer, we know of almost no or no strong risk factors in terms of environmental factors. So um, you know, neither smoking nor drinking or any other risk factors really increase your risk of prostate cancer by a lot. But we do know that prostate cancer is highly dependent on age. And the older you are, the more likely it is that you actually develop these bad luck mutations. So out of these 20 figures here, these 20 people, all of them um, develop prostate cancer because of a combination of either bad luck or bad luck combined with um, bad cancer genes that they inherited from, from a parent. So prostate cancer in this sense is not really avoidable. So in this case, actually early detection and treatment has to be a huge focus of our, of our scientific um, efforts. So what are the implications of this study? So like the bad luck theory, as I said, it caused a lot of stir in the scientific community. The implications are really that we cannot influence bad luck, bad genes, or some environmental risk factors, for example, air pollution. However, since most cancers need more than one mutation, we can prevent many cancers by limiting, it, limiting the factors that we can influence, like environmental risk factors. Another really important fact is to understand how cancer develops over time. And the fact that actually some mutations, they occur years or even decades before a normal cell turns fully into a cancer cell. And I do want to show you that in my next slide. Here you can see uh, um, the clonal evolution of cancer. Like this is the current understanding of how cancer actually develops over time. Initially on your left, um, you uh, see a normal cell and each of these stars here represents a mutation that happens in that cell over time. Um, so time progresses to your right. The height of each colored area here represents the, the quantity of cells in a cell colony. So uh, cancer starts um, at some point, and um, I'm sorry, I have to ask, like, are you able to see my, my cursor? Okay. Um, so um, if you move to your right, um, you see that individual cells within the tumor colonies develop additional mutations. And what happens at the end is that you are, you, um, once you're able to see your cancer, once it has grown to a certain size, you're actually dealing with multiple different colonies of cancer. And these colonies, they might look very different. So like you're almost different with like multiple, you're almost dealing with multiple different types of cancers because they look under at the molecular level, these different mutations have turned the cells into completely, sometimes completely different colonies. And at some point over time, maybe one of these colonies develops a mutation that allows the cancer cells to go to other places to metastasize or travel throughout the body. 
you can see this on um, in this slide. So uh, at the beginning, as I said, you're starting with a normal cell. You develop multiple mutations. Unfortunately, what at the very early stage of cancer development, there is no CT scanner. There is no test that shows us um, the level of, of a single cancer cell. We have to, at the current time, we have to wait until the cancer grows to a, a certain size. At that point, we are at the detection threshold. So if, for example, you um, get lung cancer screening or mammograms, we can see a, a tumor mass. At that point, you might get treatment, uh, maybe chemotherapy. However, the chemotherapy is usually only affecting a certain subset of these cancers. So a certain subset, subsets of these colonies, as you see, saw in the previous picture. Then maybe because of chemotherapy, the, the tumor cells shrink under your detection threshold level. So if we did another CT scan after chemotherapy or not a different treatment, you're not able to see that tumor anymore. Um, we call this remission. Unfortunately, what also happens is that the cells that are maybe not responding to that chemotherapy, they are growing back over time. And so at that point, we are dealing with relapse. So what this shows you is like, it makes a lot of sense to actually find cancer. The, the earlier you find cancer, the better, because the earlier you find cancer, the, the less differences in the cancer cells you're dealing with and the better your treatment theoretically will work. So is there a way to find out cancer at a much, early, much earlier stage than we are right now? The short answer is not yet, um, but we actually are getting there. So uh, there are multiple companies and universities that work on this, um, like a, an early cancer test. There's one company with, uh, with a very catchy name, Grail, and their test is called Galeri. It's not yet on the market, but they just reported um, a pretty interesting trial. So what they did is they had a very large cohort of people where they knew what type of cancer they had and what stage that cancer was at. What they then did is they just took a sample of blood and with that blood sample, they were able to tell in two thirds of these people what cancer, that they had cancer. And in 96% of the time, they were actually, when they were able to tell that that person had cancer, they were able to tell based on the results from the blood test, what type of cancer it was. That did depend though on the stage. So um, the, the larger the cancer was, the more likely they were able to find it with that blood test. So only in 39% of the time when a person had a known cancer at stage one, were they able to find it with that blood test? Um, and 69% at stage two, and then an 83% at stage three. The way, the reason why you are able to find cancer, even if it is growing, for example, in your lung, the reason why you are able to find it in your blood is because of that picture that you're seeing on the left. So tumor cells, they grow rapidly, they divide rapidly, and the body has to get rid of these dead tumor cells over time. So, you know, any cell over time dies. These tumor cells, they die and they spill, um, they spill the, the content of the cell into the bloodstream, including the molecular profile of that cancer cell, so the DNA. With that blood test, we can now find what's called cell-free DNA. And so we can not actually just find it in the blood, also like if somebody has brain cancer, if you look very hard at the CSF, the fluid that surrounds your brain, you are able to find little pieces of that cancer. It's a really exciting field, but until this will become um, relevant for um, all of us in the um, outside of the research area, we have to actually prove that this makes a difference in people's lives. Just finding cancer early and knowing that it's there is not, go not going to be really um, very comforting and unless you know that this actually makes a difference in your survival or in your outcomes. Um, so we are probably still a few years away from, from this test um, being orderable for like your primary care provider or your oncologist. So, 
going back to uh, where we started to risk factors for cancer. Another really exciting field um, are mutational signatures. So whenever I see a patient in front of me at the clinic, traditionally, like we are not actually able to tell them, why did you develop your cancer? Um, for example, if I have a patient with head and neck cancer and they test positive for a virus that can cause this type of head and neck cancer, but they also smoked and they also maybe drank a little bit too much, there's no way I can say, well, your cancer developed because of the virus versus your smoking. What researchers have recently published on and found might change that. On don't pay too close attention to the fine print here on, uh, on the picture, but what they found is that different risk factors leave signatures in cancer cells. You can think of it like a fingerprint. So for example, here, the, the individual columns here signify different cancer types. And so for example, for head and neck cancer, you have different fingerprints that you can see if you look closely at the DNA of the tumor that tell you what caused that cancer. So for head and neck cancer, in the future, if we are able to run these mutational signatures, we might be able to tell, even though you smoked and you drank and you have that virus that we can find in your tumor cells, this cancer was caused by the virus, not by your smoking and your drinking, or um, it might have been caused by your smoking. The reason why that is really exciting is because we already know that cancers and treatment can be quite different in terms of the success, depending on why the cancer started. So we know that, for example, head and neck cancers, if they are caused by the HPV virus, they have a much better prognosis. People do better if the cancer is caused by the virus compared to if the cancer is caused by too much smoking or drinking or other risk factors. Currently, we are not yet tailoring our treatment based on the risk factors, but in the future, we might. And obviously, for a patient, it makes a huge, huge difference if you can cut the treatment intensity by you know, a certain percentage because we find the cancer, we can kill the cancer but with a lot less treatment compared to if we really have to hit it hard because it's a, it's a more aggressive type of cancer. A really interesting story um, that also had to do with these mutational signatures is a disease called Balkan endemic nephropathy. It's also called Chinese herb nephropathy. Um, at the end of my talk, I'm actually, I put up some references, like there was a, uh, an interesting article, and I think it was the New Yorker, how researchers found this mutational signature and were able to like tie different diseases together. So the story here is that for kidney cancer, we have all types of different risk factors. One risk factor is smoking, but another risk factor is um, something called aristolochic acid, which is a plant toxin. Um, that plant toxin comes from a plant called beerthwort. Um, and we already knew um, from like the early um, 20th century that there are certain, certain little villages um, around the Danube that where people develop a rare form of kidney failure. And some of them also develop a rare form of urinary tract cancer. Well, then there was also a, independent, this group of like, I think 20 women in a Belgian weight loss clinic who also developed kidney failure. And they also developed this rare form of um, urethelial cancer. When they looked at these tumors, they actually found this mutational signature that was caused by the same poison, by the same um, aristolochic acid, this plant poison. And so uh, by using this mutational signature, they were able to tell this is the underlying risk factors. And now they're actually looking into um, other um, populations like you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of Asian um, populations where this type of um, Chinese, um, uh, traditional Chinese medicine that includes some of this poison is actually used pretty widely. So, uh, by using these mutational signatures, it might be able to find risk factors that we are not aware of yet. So 
one um, once somebody developed cancer, um, it's kind of the the cat is out of the bag. Like um, I do want to shift the the focus of the talk a little bit towards what can we do to prevent cancer from happening in the first place. For the United States, it's actually we have pretty good data on what are the most common environmental or lifestyle risk factors um, that cause cancer, and it is quite interesting um, that we could prevent almost 50% of cancers in the United States by avoiding these risk factors. Um, and 20%, so 20% of cancers in the United States are caused by tobacco smoking, um, but also 7.8% by excess body weight, alcohol, UV light. Um, and again, I just want to highlight this number, almost half of the patients with cancer in the United States we could avoid cancer from ever developing by um, avoiding these risk factors. Everybody knows smoking causes cancer, um, but um, I think it's always in, in your mind, well, smoking causes lung cancer. It's not just lung cancer. A um, lot of different cancers um, in the urogenital system, so kidney cancer, ovarian cancer, head and neck cancer, as a vagal cancer, lots of different cancers, um, the risk for those is increased because of a smoking history. What about um, the other risk factors? So obesity. Obesity is actually um, very likely going to uh, become a more important risk factor for cancer compared to smoking soon, because you know um, we have made a lot of progress in terms of decreasing smoking rates in the, in the United States. Obesity, not so successful. So uh, if you look at the cancers that are associated with obesity, um, in this picture, all the cancers highlighted in red um, and the cancers highlighted in dark blue are associated with obesity. So uh, head and neck cancer, thyroid, gallbladder cancer, esophageal cancer, all of these cancers, your risk of developing these cancers is increased if you're, um, if you're obese. Physical activity, um, it's not just that you'll make your cardiologist happy um, if, you have, if you are physically very active, it also decreases your risk for cancer development. Um, cancers that are associated with physical inactivity, um, lung cancer, bladder cancer, um, and then the cancers highlighted in dark blue as well. What about physical activity? Like what level is actually recommended to like get your most uh, benefit um, in terms of health or like disease prevention? So I just wanted to put this slide up here because it is, um, especially for, for children, um, physical activity, um, you have to get to a pretty decent level that we are not right now, like not doing a great job in. So for kids age three to five, three hours per day of activity of all intensities um, might not be too hard. If you have little kids, um, at least um, the ones I know, they don't want to sit still anyway, unless you put them in front of a screen. Um, however, school age children, adolescents, 60 minutes or more of physical activity um, daily, depending on your school schedule, um, your um, PE class, that's sometimes hard to do. And then for adults, they set the bar pretty low. You should avoid physical inactivity. So any activity is better than inactivity. But to really get your full benefit of physical activity, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity such as running is recommended. So I always recommend for my patients, um, you know, walking, most people actually are able to walk. Um, you are getting a lot of benefit by doing that on a regular basis. Physical inactivity, we actually know that um, being active reduces your risk of cancer death, not just of cancer, but even dying from cancer. Being inactive for 13 hours or more per day increases your risk of dying from cancer by 82%. Um, and getting your steps in um, decreases your risk of cancer death as well. So in this study where they looked at steps per day, they actually looked at a cohort of people and compared, and those people, um, you know, some of them had cancer, some of them didn't have cancer. But what they found is 
that the group of people who uh, uh, got more than 8,000 steps in per day, um, they had a significantly lower risk of dying from cancer to compared to the people who uh, only walked walk 4,000 steps or less per day. We are not doing great um, in, in our country in terms of physical activity. So one in seven adults um, in the US are physically inactive. Only a quarter of children and youth, they get the recommended hour of moderate to vigorous um, physical activity per day. What about alcohol? Um, I am um, going to uh, um, go over this fairly quickly. I just want to remind people moderate alcohol consumption is actually fairly little. So if you if you look at this, it's uh, defined as having up to one drink per day for women, up to two drinks per day for men. Any level above this, um, we know very well increases your risk for cancer development. And you can see these cancers that are associated with alcohol in the white. So certain types of head and neck cancer as vagal cancer, stomach cancer, but also breast cancer, um, liver and colorectal cancer. Cancer prevention recommendations for diet have a couple of goals. Um, those goals are to increase your fiber intake. Um, fiber, um, we know, has a couple of benefits. It does decrease your risk for colorectal cancer, one of the most common cancers. And it also decreases your chance for becoming overweight or obese. There's strong evidence that eating whole grains um, protects against colorectal cancer and then foods containing um, dietary fiber um, protects, as I said, against weight gain, overweight, and obesity. You're supposed to like, consume at least 30 grams of fiber per day. Well, I have a hard time picturing what 30 grams of fiber, fiber per day are. So here's just a, a picture of what this looks like. And it's actually not, not too hard if you're eating fresh fruit vegetables and you get in your grains and your legumes. Lots of patients ask about meat. Well, the recommendation is not to completely avoid meat. Um, meat can be a valuable source of nutrients, um, protein, iron, B12. Um, you don't have to eat meat, um, but meat in moderation um, is probably okay. Um, eat little, if any, processed meat. So uh, um, I'm from Germany, I do, I do like processed meats, um, very in, in moderation. I think it's, it might be, um, if you have to have advice, it might be okay. At least that's what I'm telling myself. But you know, um, ultimately, um, very little of any processed meat. What about um, other dietary choices? So uh, non-alcoholic beverages, sugar, Another, that's another topic that um, I'm being asked in my clinic a lot. Um, yes, sugar feeds cancer, but sugar also feeds any other cell in your body. So even if you completely cut out sugar from your diet, um, since your brain can actually only function on sugar, your body is really good at making sugar, even if you don't eat any. However, sugar really has like not really any nutritional benefit. So uh, drink mostly water, unsweetened drinks, limit the consumption or completely get rid of any sugar sweetened beverages. We do know that they highly contribute to the obesity problem we have in this country. On the good news though, is if you're a coffee drinker, you have the cancer community's blessing to drink as much coffee as you want. Um, it seems right now, based on the current evidence that coffee actually decreases the risk of liver cancer and endometrial cancer. And there was just a, an interesting study that came out. Um, I think it probably has to be replicated um, before we can really trust those recommendations. But it, it looks like people who drink lots of coffee and who have metastatic colon cancer, they actually might survive longer compared to people who don't drink any coffee. Supplements is another topic um, that we discuss a lot in our clinic, um, in the oncology clinic. So unfortunately, there's no convincing evidence right now at all that supplements are better than a healthy diet. If you are not able to eat a healthy diet for whatever reasons, um, multivitamins are probably okay. 
We do have some evidence on the contrary that like sub supplements in high doses, for example, vitamin A, B6, and B12, they might actually increase your risk for lung cancer um, or uh, potentially for, for other cancers. UV light, we all know too much sun is harmful. Um, I only want to um, highlight the numbers. So 90% of melanoma, uh, which is the bad type of skin cancer, 90% of melanoma is actually caused by too much sun exposure. And um, if you look at the numbers, we have over 100,000 new melanomas that are being diagnosed in the, in the US per year. So just to plea, cover yourself up, um, use lots of sunscreen um, and avoid uh, tanning, tanning devices, tanning with the sun lamps, sun beds. There are also cancer causing bugs. Um, so a helicobacter pylori um, is, a, is a bug that lives, can live in your stomach. Um, it's transmitted mainly by unclean water and it can cause stomach cancer, it can cause lymphoma. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C can cause liver cancer lymphoma. For hepatitis B, we have very effective vaccines. Hepatitis C, we now have um, very uh, successful, very effective treatment. So there the key is really get vaccinated, um, get screened for hepatitis C and get treated before the cancer develops. HPV, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the UN papillomavirus but HPV can cause cervical cancer, anal cancer, some head and neck cancers, penile, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. And we have highly effective vaccine for HPV. Um, we also have EBV, HIV, and then some rare, for example, they are called liver flukes. Um, they are not um, a big cause of, of cancer here in the United States, but in some other countries um, where these liver flukes are endemic, um, you can see uh, um, a large proportion of people with this type of cancer. It comes from, from these liver flukes that live inside of your bile ducts and cause chronic irritation and um, bile duct cancer. So human papilloma virus um, causes over 34,000 cancers per year in the United States. And we know that the vaccine can prevent up to 90% of HPV related cancers. It's quite concerning that um, last year, only 57, like a little bit over half, only a little bit over half of boys and girls were actually up to date with the recommended HPV vaccine. And if we compare that to other high income countries, we actually have um, lower vaccination rates than other countries. Australia, they have vaccination rates over 70% and they can eliminate cervical cancer within the next 20 years. They are on track to completely get rid of cervical cancer. And I really think if somebody is opposed to, uh, to vaccinations, especially HPV vaccination, come to our clinic and look at what people with head and neck cancer have to go through. It's, it's horrific treatment. Um, if you can prevent people have to go through this type of treatment for head and neck cancer, I think anybody would, would understand why vaccination is so critical. I just touched base on a few risk factors and a few um, efforts for prevention. But um, on this slide here, you can see all the risk factors, um, environmental risk factors that are currently known and where we have really good evidence. And in green, you can see the, the preventative efforts that we currently know are working. Um, this is a list that's updated every year by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a department within the World Health Organization. I do want to shift um, a little bit into new areas of research. So um, we, uh, um, what is very exciting and you know, what we hear a lot about is the microbiome. It's like, how does the microbiome actually interact with your cancer risk? So what is the microbiome? It's the, um, the definition is that it's the collective genomes of microorganisms that live inside and on the human body. And you're actually dealing with like 10 to trillion, uh, 10 to 100 trillion cells. So that's as much as your own human body cells you also have in 
micro in the microbiome and the bugs living in and on you, which is quite mind boggling. Um, and we are dealing with over 10,000 different species that occupy the human occupy the human ecosystem. It has been really hard to study the human microbiome just because of this um, incredible number and this diversity. What has been studied best is actually the, the gut microbiome um, and 99% of your micro, uh, microbiome mass is actually in the gut. So like that has been studied the most. And you can see that we are becoming a lot smarter in terms of what the microbiome is, what it does and how it influences your, the function of the human, of your body. So between 2005 and 2015, research has increased by 2000% in terms of um, publications about the human micro microbiome. What we know is that microbiomes, they differ a lot between different individuals and they also differ a lot between different organs in your body. And the microbiome can change a lot in response to what you eat, what medication you take, um, what environment you live in, and then also your lifestyle. In one study, they tried to look at what actually influences your human microbiome. And they looked at a lot of different factors. So over 125 factors, and they were only able to explain 19% of the variation in the human gut microbiome composition. So that tells you how how variable, how, um, how many factors influence the human microbiome and therefore also like how difficult it is to really study um, what, what happens because of the human microbiome. What we already know is that the microbiome is different between people with cancer and healthy controls. However, what we don't know is like, what is the chicken and what is the egg? Um, so uh, is the microbiome different because somebody has cancer or does somebody have cancer because the, the microbiome caused the cancer or had, had, had an effect on the cancer development. I do think, um, so this, this next slide and like this next video is actually has uh, not a whole lot to do with cancer risk, but I do think that no oncology talk nowadays can not include immunotherapy. Um, so, uh, um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I do, uh, um, I think I'll actually skip that video, that video because we are a little bit short on time, but um, what I um, want to uh, show you is like what we know about immunotherapy and the human microbiome. So what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is where we take your own immune system and we try to uh, we try to uh, make the the immune system recognize cancer cells and kill cancer cells, which is actually the normal function of your immune system. Then um, currently, we really only have a pretty rudimentary understanding of why some people respond to immunotherapy and why others don't. The microbiome seems to play a pretty important role um, in the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And for example, we know that if you take antibiotics close to immunotherapy, um, then you might be actually less likely to respond to immunotherapy. Also, diet probably plays a role in the response to immunotherapy. Um, but we don't currently fully understand of like what is the ideal diet that you're supposed to eat in order to respond to immunotherapy. So we covered the we covered environmental risk factors. We covered bad luck, and the last part of my talk is really um, where we talk about the bad genes. Um, it is estimated that about ten to fifteen percent of cancers are caused from bad genes, and what this means is these genes they also cause these cancer mutations that ultimately lead from a normal cell to a cancer cell. So how do we assess genetic risk? Well, we uh, hopefully when you see your provider for the first time, they take your family history. So family history is one, one clue to that there might be bad genes at play in terms of risk factor for cancer. We also have like calculators, risk assessment tools, and we have molecular testing. 
um, this molecular testing is either offered directly to consumer testing where you can order it on Amazon or directly from the company or um, your healthcare provider orders this and where we actually look at um, a different set of genes that we know increase your cancer risk. For some cancers, we automatically recommend that we look at your inherited risk for cancer. So for example, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and prostate, metastatic prostate cancer, we do recommend that we look at genes that you are born with. However, for example, for breast cancer, only certain breast cancer patients are currently recommended to get tested for inherited gene mutations. What the problem with that is that guidelines only catch a certain proportion of women who with breast cancer only have inherited mutations. So one study looked at of looked at all the women who fulfilled criteria based on the guidelines and that found that 9% of women who fulfilled these criteria had a genetic mutation. However, they also tested women who didn't fulfill the criteria for the genetic testing and 8% of those women did have genetic mutations. So, well, that tells you maybe we are missing um, this, uh, an important number of women who are born with genes that they also that might make um, an impact on their treatment and could also influence their family um, and their, their kids, their siblings, um, their parents. So uh, that leads to the question, should we actually test every cancer patient for genes that they are born with? We already test the vast majority of patients, if you have advanced cancer, we do actually now in the area of personalized medicine, we do test your cancer and look for specific mutations that your cancer has so that we can target your treatment. But we don't really test for genes that you are born with. A study that just came out um, very recently, I think like two weeks ago or so, came from the Mayo, the Mayo Clinic. And they looked at almost 3000 cancer patients 13% of them had a significant mutation that actually influenced their cancer treatment. And 6% of those would have not been tested based on current guidelines. What Mayo Clinic is doing based on the study is that they are now saying, okay, every cancer patient that comes through our door, we are going to test or we are going to offer genetic testing. If you do it or not, that's a completely different, um, different conversation. Um, but I do think in the future, we might actually get there where we say, okay, we know the risk factors for cancer. Um, one of those risk factors is bad genes. We do offer testing for everybody. And my last slide um, just leaves you with the recommendations of um, being safe, um, being healthy, and the recommendations for cancer prevention from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And I hope I told you something um, that you didn't already know, and I'm um, very excited to hear any questions. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Fitzmaurice, for a fascinating presentation. Um, very, very interesting stuff. And we do have a number of questions who come in that have come in from our viewers, so I'm going to start uh, going through those. The first one is, I grew up in a small town with a lot of air pollution from a paper mill and moved away about 20 years ago. Should I still be worried about my risk for getting cancer from that exposure at the earlier part of my life? Yeah, so that's a really um, pertinent question. So um, the tricky part with cancer risk factors is they take a long, a long time to actually um, to lead to cancer development. So let's say you did have that exposure from the air pollution from the paper mill and maybe it, this pollution actually caused a mutation in one cell in your lungs. Um, and over time, the cell might just sit there. But if additional mutations that happen over time, for example, bad luck, additional risk factors, then it could lead to, uh, to cancer 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So um, the short answer is yes. Um, and you know, what, you, what you can do is to like, limit any other risk factors that you can influence. Right. Um, and I think the second question is probably referring to the test you referenced early on and the blood samples. Um, the question is, is this what they call a blood biopsy? 
Um, is that in fact called a blood biopsy or is that something different? So it's the same concept. Um, liquid blood-based biopsies or liquid biopsies, they also look for cell-free cancer DNA. Um, this is also a fairly new development, but um, we, we use it that is already pretty widely used. Um, so for example, if you have um, lung cancer, but we can't really get to the spots where the cancer is easily with a biopsy or with surgery, we order liquid biopsies. And these liquid biopsies, they do look for the cell-free DNA. So like for this genetic, um, genetic material that the cancer sheds into the bloodstream. And that allows us to like find any mutations that might help us to treat you appropriately. Great. Do you have advice for people who want to get some vitamin D from the sun, but also want to be careful about avoiding skin cancer? Yeah. Um, that's, you know, here in, in central Oregon, like we, uh, we get a lot of sun and like, that is a question that comes up pretty often. Yes. You know, you, you need sun, you should be outside um, and you need the sun um, for your vitamin D levels. Um, it's really um, stay out of the sun during, um, you know, the noon hours when the sun is um, uh, the hottest, the most intense, still use your sunscreen. Um, and, but I do have to say, you know, a lot of people here are vitamin D deficient. So, you know, the other, um, the other part is that you might need to take vitamin D supplements. Great. What is the recommended age for the first dose of the HPV vaccine for kids? Oh, good question. Um, I think it's 14 or 16, but I actually don't quote me. Like your primary care physician or your pediatrician actually should, should know this really well. Great. Right. Um, I had my children vaccinated for HPV as adolescents, yet one still tested positive for HPV as a young adult. Why did the HPV vaccine not work? Vaccines are um, usually not 100% effective. So, you know, one, um, one reason is your child might have been the unlucky one where the vaccine didn't work. Another reason is um, once you are infected, the vaccine is not going to work anymore. A different reason is that you actually have multiple different HPV strains. So the vaccine, depending on, I think here in the, in the US, we have like a quadrivalent and a nanovalent vaccine. Um, again, don't quote me, um, but so they only cover four or nine strains of HPV, um, but there are a lot more strains. So it could be that the vaccine just didn't cover the strain that your child was uh, infected with. The good news is if, um, if you do get infected as a young person, your body is actually pretty good in getting rid of HPV. However, the older you get, the less likely your body is able to get rid of the virus. And so you still absolutely need to get vaccinated. Right. Is a blood test performed to detect pancreatic cancer or what type of test is it? For Pancreatic cancer, currently there is no blood test approved that screens for pancreatic cancer. The test that I was talking about in the beginning, like the Galeri test um, from, from that company, Grail, um, I find the, the name funny. Um, anyway, that blood test is one of these types of blood tests that ultimately might allow us to screen for cancer by just using a blood test. And it would screen not just for pancreatic cancer. So like this test is actually, for example, it includes 50 different types of cancers. But again, you saw that if, for example, pancreatic cancer, let's say the blood test could find pancreatic cancer, you saw that for stage one, so pancreatic cancer that is still curable, that's limited to the pancreas, the sensitivity of that test was pretty low, meaning that even if you have pancreatic cancer, it might miss it in a, in a large number of people. Um, when you talked about getting 8,000 or more steps daily to help with cancer prevention, does it matter how you get the steps? In other words, does it it matter if you're running or walking to get those steps? 
No, it was pretty much any um, any way of getting your steps. Um, and um, I, I think that's the bottom line of like physical activity is even if you can't run, even if you can't, um, you know, you can't, you're not a super athlete as we have so many here in Bend for some reason that I found out. Um, but even if you're not a super athlete, just walking is perfectly fine. Um, it's just the, the crucial key is anything, any physical activity is better than not. Great. Well, Dr. Fitzmaurice, that looks like all of the questions that um, we've received. So I want to thank you very, very much for your wonderful presentation tonight and thank all of our viewers for joining us. Uh, we're glad you could make it and stay tuned for another Doc Talk in January. Uh, we will put out information on our Facebook page. Be sure to follow us there. That's where we post many, many of our events. And you can uh, keep track of when the next Doc Talk will take place and what that topic will be. So thank you once again for joining us this evening. And we wish you all uh, a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.